Welcome to the seminar series Sewer and Pipeline Engineering. In this video today we are dealing with the so-called open cut method. That is the laying of sewers and pipes in open trenches. And this time we are specifically concerned with practical handling, so the typical construction process in open trenches. First of all, let us take a look at the task. What does it actually mean when we want to lay a pipeline in a trench? Is it that simple? What does it look like underground? Do we have even room for new pipes? Then it's worth taking a look at the historical development. Open trench construction has a long tradition, so how has the construction process developed over time? And then we come to the core of this seminar. What does the practical construction process look like? So the whole procedure from the preparatory work to the actual installation and the acceptance of the work. Well, let's start with the task itself. What can we expect underground? Now, in the ideal case, it should look like on this picture. We already know this from the first session of the seminar. And we know that reality often looks much more complicated. The lines are often crisscrossing the underground and there are also the roots of the trees and interacting with them. But even in the ideal case on this picture, if we want to lay all these pipes underground in an open construction method, it won't be easy. Especially the sewer pipes in the middle of the road are often quite large and often quite deep. Special techniques are required to construct a trench in an economically sensible and technically reliable way. And all of this has developed strongly over time, so let's take a closer look at the historical development. When and how did sewer and pipeline construction actually begin? Well, the first sewers were built in the middle of the 19th century and here we can see a photo documentation from 1890. The picture obviously shows that the open construction method was at the beginning strongly characterized by manual labor and thus by a high level of personal input. All work steps were carried out by hand, from excavation, laying the pipes, to finally filling the trenches. Numerous brick-built sewers were constructed during this early phase of sewer engineering. Well, and how did the development continue then? Now, from manual work, more and more people moved on to using machines. This included digging and filling the trench, as well as lifting and laying the pipes. And the laying of pipes with the use of machines naturally offered further opportunities. Old, large sewers were usually built of masonry because the stones could also be transported to the construction site by hand. Now, with the construction crane, it was possible for the first time to lift even large pipes, for example made of concrete or reinforced concrete. Prefabrication is the key word, so that large pipes could already be produced in the pipe factory, and then delivered to the construction site. This naturally accelerated the construction work on site immensely, so that it was possible to concentrate on pure groundwork operations. However, securing and shoring deep trenches was still very time consuming and was done completely by hand. This was the starting point for further development, namely flexible and modular shoring technology. With this shoring technology, it was now possible to build quickly and safely. Here we see, for example, a sliding rail shoring where the side shoring panels can slide past each other. This then offers particular flexibility throughout the entire process. In the meantime, installation and trench shoring methods are also being jointly developed. At the same time, the aim is to build quickly and safely and also to further reduce trench widths. Because excavation costs a lot of money. The most important next and very recent step was the development of flowable backfill. The excavated soil or special soil mixtures are enriched and mixed with water, cement and clay minerals. This liquid material remains liquid during the filling process. It can therefore completely flow around the pipe even in very narrow trenches and it can also fill all other cavities. The pipe must of course be secured against buoyancy. Afterwards, the material hardens and forms a stable bedding for the pipe and a stable underground, for example, for road construction. 
The method also offers completely new opportunities, for example, for reducing trench widths. Actually, one only has to go into the trench to take care of the buoyancy control. However, the construction companies must have very special know-how and a great deal of experience because mistakes during installation can hardly be corrected. And the backfill material itself must also meet a wide range of requirements. It must be flowable during filling, then it should be possible to build over it, but it must not harden too much with regard to later excavation, and it must also be recyclable after excavation. The whole thing is therefore an extremely exciting development and we will look at it in detail in another video. After this somewhat longer introduction, we now come to the actual topic, the practical process. What is the exact, exact procedure if we want to lay a sewer or a pipe in open construction? A very practical summary of the individual work steps can be found here, for example, in the construction site manual of DWA, a German professional association for wastewater technology. We at IKT provided support in the preparation of this manual back in 2002. And the manual is still very up-to-date today. It summarizes the essential work steps in a very clear way. The structure of the process is shown here. It begins with a preparatory work and continues through pipe installation and backfilling up to clearing the construction site. Let us now look at the steps in detail. Number one, what do we understand by preparatory tasks? Well, first of all, this includes traffic safety. A construction site in the road area is always an intervention in the traffic flow. To secure the traffic flow, warning beacons or fences can be used. If the construction site is longer, it may also be necessary to install traffic lights. The whole thing then also has to be approved. But even then, there may be many other pipelines underground. The maps of the other supply and sewer systems should be consulted in order to be prepared for possible crossing pipelines. At such places, excavation should be done by hand. And finally, the static calculation of the entire structure consisting of pipe and soil should be available before the construction work begins. What was assumed in the calculation must also be known on the construction site. The best structural calculation is useless if other backfill materials, other pipe materials or other shoring techniques are used on site than those assumed in the calculation. In case of doubt, we need a new calculation for the changed conditions. Then the next step is of course to get the pipes and manholes onto the site and to start the construction work. Here it is important to check the quality of the pipes at the construction site before installation, because at this point the components can still be easily replaced. This applies, for example, if they have been damaged during transport or if the delivery note shows that they do not correspond to what was ordered. The dimensional accuracy should also be checked on a random basis. Most types of pipes are joined together on the building side using a system of spigot and socket with a seal on the spigot end. However, this only works if the pipe dimensions are correct. If they are not correct, the pipes can either hardly be pushed together or the seal is not sufficiently compressed to really have a sealing effect. All in all, whatever does not meet the requirements must be rejected. A later replacement, when the whole thing is already in the trench, is much more difficult. All components that have been accepted on the construction site must then, of course, be stored appropriately. Three things are always of great importance. First, any danger from unintentional movement must be ruled out. Round pipes can roll, this is in the nature of things. And pipes can quickly weigh several hundred kilos up to tons. Anyone who then even gets his foot under such a pipe is seriously injured. There have also been deaths. This is particularly tragic when playing children can get onto the construction site and move unsecured pipes. This is always to be expected and courts have already rendered harsh sentences for the responsible site managers. In addition, the pipes must of course be stored in such a way 
that they themselves do not suffer any damage due to environmental influences. For example, clay pipes or the cement mortar lining of cast iron pipes are sensitive to impact. Concrete pipes are sensitive to aggressive media and thermoplastics show deformation under their own weight or sensitivity to the sun's UV rays at higher temperatures. So keep in mind, when storing, follow the manufacturer's instructions. The product standards can also provide valuable information. And let me underline this once again, hazardous areas should be cordoned off and sources of danger should be visible to everybody. Next, the pipes have to be transported from the storage area to the pipe trench. Not an easy task, especially with large, heavy pipes. Lifting and transporting is a separate load case and the pipes must be designed for this. And of course, the appropriate lifting gear must also be used on the construction site. The fact that the transport case also needs its own statics can be seen very clearly in the picture on the right. The pipe is held at a single point due to its weight, large bending loads and tensile stresses occur at this very point. After installation, however, the pipe lies evenly embedded in the ground. If only for this second case a statics was calculated, this is not sufficient. Especially in the area of the transport anchor, the pipe must be dimensioned for the transport load. In addition, the pipe also experiences vibrations during installation. Impact loads may also occur, for example, in contact with the lifting gear or the shoring of the trench. And that brings us to the pipe trench itself. This, of course, has to be secured. As a rule, the trench is excavated step by step, depending on the progress of, progress of the construction work. However, longer construction stages are also possible if the disturbance of the surface is unproblematic and the available construction equipment allows this. On the left, we see an excavation by hand. This is especially necessary when crossing pipes are expected. Greater trench depth must always be secured by means of shoring. But shoring also plays a major role in pipe statics. There are different types and this can lead to different loads. In the middle picture, we see horizontal planks supported by struts. In this type of horizontal shoring, the planks can be installed one after the other with the excavation. And in the same way, they can be removed again when backfilling. The backfilling soil then always has direct contact with the soil next to it. Now there is not only horizontal shoring, but also vertical shoring. For example, sheet piles are rammed vertically into the ground and then the trench is excavated. If such a trench is backfilled, the sheet piles are usually only pulled again afterwards. And everyone can imagine the result where the shoring was before, there is a cavity afterwards. The backfilling soil then loosens up and does not have such a good contact with the existing soil. In this case, the pipe is subjected to greater loads than with horizontal shoring. Well, the whole thing is a very exciting topic for the technical analysis, but we will come to this in a later video. Here, for the time being, we will stay with the construction process. And there we can also do without shoring, but only in a few cases. This is only possible in stable ground up to 1.25 meter trench depth. Only then is it possible to work without shoring, at least in accordance with current regulations as we know them in Germany, for example. And keep in mind, the, uh, the accident prevention regulations of the insurance companies or the professional associations must be observed. Looking at standards, the securing of excavation pits and trenches is dealt with in DIN 4124, for example. The value of 1.25 meters can be found here. For excavations deeper than 1.25 meters, measures must always be taken to secure the trench, even in stable soils. This can be an embankment or shoring of the trench. From a depth of 1.75 meters, at the latest, the trench must be completely secured, that means from the bottom to the top of the trench. And if shoring or embankment is required, then we also need a protective strip of at least 60 centimeters width in the upper area. 
However, trench excavation is of course not only possible with shoring, but also with embankments and slopes. In well-stable soils, a slope can even be 5 meters deep. In all cases, however, the angle of the slope should be verified in the structural calculation. Accidents caused by trench collapse are usually associated with considerable personal injuries. As one cubic meter of soil weighs approximately two tons, buried workers are already crushed by the weight of the soil. The external pressure hinders in particular the lifting of the chest and so it hinders breathing. Even if the victim's head is still completely free, he or she may suffocate. In this example shown on this slide, the severely injured worker was enclosed by the earth up to the waist, the killed worker was enclosed up to above chest level. Here we take another look at the practice. On the left you can see the typical protective strip. The backfilled soil is not located at the edge of the excavation pit, but only at a clear distance. However, we might ask whether the excavator is still sufficiently far away from the edge of the excavation pit. On the right we see the projection of the shoring elements. The shoring should project by around 5 to 10 centimeters above side surface level. Why all this? Well, to prevent tools or other objects from slipping or rolling into the trench. The trench is now safe, then we can go to the next step and work in this trench. In the trench it is important that there is an appropriate working space. The European Standard 1610, for example, provides information for sewer construction. The minimum trench width is, depending on the trench depth, up to one meter larger than the outer pipe diameter. The reason for this can be easily seen in this picture. The pipes must be well embedded in the ground. This includes that the soil next to the pipe is well compacted. And not only there, but also the support zone under the pipe. On the right you can see how the support zone is compacted from the side with manual tempers. Obviously the workers have enough space to do this and the support zone is extremely important for good pipe statics because the so-called support angle depends on it. If you do not compact well here because it is too narrow, you can be almost certain that the pipe will crack or deform in the long term. So let us summarize, compaction work, which is very important for the structural behavior, requires a sufficiently large working space. How much this is, this is stated, for example, in the European Standard EN 1610. In narrow areas, the required support properties must be ensured by special measured measures. This can be, for example, a preformation of the complete support, as shown on the left or we generally use flowable backfill in the pipe zone as shown on the right picture. Here we see two solutions for pushing heavy pipes into each other. Below we see how it is done quickly and seemingly easily. With the excavator scoop the pipe is pressed over a square timber and pushed into another pipe that is not visible here. Surely there are excavator drivers who can do this, however, it is also clear that uh, large forces are used to press the pipe almost uncontrolled. Something can slip off at any time. And the resulting force can also lead to extreme strains and damage to the pipe joint. The procedure is improper and should be avoided. Above we see the installation of the pipes with the pulling device. At the other end of the pipe string, the pulling device is braced and pulls new pipes into the joint. Naturally, the resultant force here lies within the pipe connection area. And this significantly reduces the risk of damage due to constraining stresses. Here we see how the position is controlled by laser. On the left picture, the laser beam sets the target axis in such a way that this can be aligned with the target plate. If the position is not correct, it should be corrected carefully by hand. The excavator bucket is of course taboo here as well. The European Standard 1610 also deals with this and I quote Any necessary adjustments to level shall be made by raising or lowering the bedding, always ensuring that the pipes are finally provided with support along their whole length. 
And now the crucial part. Adjustment to level and position shall not be made by local packing. So never put a stone under the end of the pipe just to correct the position. This stone is a point load that nobody has taken into account in the statics. After laying the pipes, before the trench is filled in, there is a last chance to inspect them from the outside. This means that external damage can be visually detected for the last time before the trench is filled. And you should definitely take advantage of this opportunity. Repairs, for example, are now still easier to carry out. If an entire section of the sewer is exposed between two manholes, even leak tests can be an option. Because then you can really see for the last time where a pipe is leaking and water is flowing out during the test. Later everything is in the dark and you have to rely solely on limit values for water addition during the test. Test errors also often remain undetected when the pipe is buried. It is therefore worthwhile to demand such leak tests before backfill-in, which was also required for example in former German standards. Now a sewer pipe only makes sense when something flows through it later. That means we need connections for the incoming sewers from buildings, the so-called laterals. These connections can already be integrated into the pipe as branches or they can be created later on site. In these pictures we see above the installation on a concrete pipe. First the hole is drilled with a core drill and then a so-called connection socket is inserted or screwed into this opening. There is a large variety of systems available on the market. Some examples can be seen in the area below. The IKT also carries out comparative tests for these products. The results can be found on our website. The importance of the technical quality of the connection can already be seen from the fact that there is a connection in the sewer system approximately every 5 meters. And defective connections are one of the most common damage patterns in the sewer system. This is of course also due to the fact that in the past it was not possible to work with such connection elements but rather the main sewers were simply opened up and then a connecting pipe was pushed in. Special devices have also been developed to check the tightness of the connection elements on site in open trenches. Here we see an example where testing is carried out with water pressure. In the case of leaks, the leakage can be seen directly during the test. When the trench is further backfilled, side backfilling or lateral backfilling is of particular importance. This is the soil next to the pipe. Like the pipe, it carries part of the later load and also supports the pipe laterally. In principle, there are three column structures at the bottom of the trench which can be used to support the vertical loads. This is the pipe itself and these are the two soil areas to the right and to the left of the pipe. When the lateral backfill is complete, the so-called main backfill is installed in individual layers above the pipe. This is first done carefully with light equipment until a certain overlap of 30 centimeters to 1 meter is achieved. Afterwards, it can be compacted with heavy equipment as shown in the picture on the right. Once the trench has been completely filled, the structure can finally be subjected to acceptance tests. A typical technique for the acceptance testing of sewer pipes is the CCTV inspection. There is a wide range of cameras on the market. These cameras are driven into the sewer on so-called carts and can scan the complete pipe wall. So-called satellite cameras also make it possible to drive from the main sewer into the connecting pipes. There are also camera systems that work with 360 degree scanners and thus record enough data to completely reprodu reproduce the sewer surface in the computer. The aim of camera inspection is to detect possible damage, assess its significance and, if necessary, initiate repair measures. In addition to the simple camera inspection, there are, of course, a lot of special measuring procedures to obtain more detailed information about the geometry and about the condition of sewers and pipes. Particularly in the case of flexible systems, it can be useful to measure the pipe cross-section in order to reliably detect excessive deformation. We will take a closer look at inspection technology in one of the next seminar videos. 
But of course it is not only about the pipe, but also about the road. After all, the trench backfill not only has the function of covering the pipe, but it is also the basis for the subsequent road construction. Accordingly, special acceptance tests are also carried out here. This usually takes place on the subgrade, that is, on the ground layer on which the road structure is next to be placed. The subgrade is subject to special requirements regarding compaction and the permissible deformation module of the soil. The picture on the left shows an example of a dynamic probing. Here, the compaction over the depth is estimated by counting the number of blows required when ramming an iron rod into the soil. In the middle we see a dynamic and on the right a static plate load test. These tests serve to determine the deformation properties of the soil. And then we take this opportunity to recall the shoring effects. If we see on the construction side that the sheet piles are only being drawn at the end, it is definitely worth taking another look at the static calculation, because the removal of the shoring must be in accordance with the static calculation. If a vertical shoring with sheet piles were chosen and if the sheet piles were subsequently drawn, that is, with resulting cavities, then this must also have been specified as a boundary condition in the structural analysis. Well, if, if everything is correct, though, the road construction can begin. Road construction technology is of course primarily oriented towards the construction of the roads themselves and less towards the interaction with pipe trenches and for example manhole covers. In the case of new construction for example the correct integration of manhole covers into the road superstructure also is a special task. Here too quality must be ensured. If the trench was dug in an existing road, it is also important that the road surface above the trench is cleanly connected to the old road surface. This applies both for reasons of traffic safety and for reasons of durability. After all, the entire sewer structure and the road should safely achieve the intended service life, which is usually many decades. And that brings me to the end of this video. We have seen what a difficult task we face if we want to lay sewers and pipelines in our cities using the open cut method. We also have seen what developments have been necessary over the last 150 years to work safely and efficiently. And we have learned about the practical construction process. We have seen, for example, that we have to store the pipes safely on the construction site, that we need a lot of space in the trench to work successfully and that the choice of shoring and road construction also play an important role. But perhaps you have watched this video because you yourself have experience with these issues. Perhaps you too have suggestions or ideas for improvement on one or the other topic. Then you are welcome to contact me. You can find my contact details at IKT Institute for Underground Infrastructure. Thank you.